Now, you know, the Bible talks about that his, how, the, the, as high as the heaven is above the earth, his thoughts, that's how high his thoughts are, are above ours and his ways are, are above ours. We got to understand who we are and, and, and just know this, that you can't even have the proper relationship with God unless you come to him with humility. Because, and if you think about it, you can't be saved from your sins unless you come to God with humility. You got to come to God and understand you need a savior. Your, your whole salvation is based on the fact that you understand that you are in your sin and you can't save yourself from your own self. You can't save yourself from the sins that you commit. It takes the God of heaven who stepped out of heaven himself in the person of Jesus and came down and said, I'm going to save all of us from their sin. Every one of us. And I'll just say this to the church. There ought to be no way knowing that we um, have been saved from our own sins by God himself. We know that. But we, we should not, having known uh, who we were and what it took for God to get us where we are now. We should never believe that we can act without the guidance of God. The church ought to just know that. And, 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 and so I, I believe that it is humility that causes one, no matter what state they're in, to seek after God. Because you ought to know, if, if you have the proper kind of humility, then you know you can't make it in this life without him. And so we get down to uh, the part where God says, if my people shall humble themselves and pray, um, it says that they also need to seek my face. What does it mean when God says in this text that we ought to seek his face? Well, first of all, understand this. This phrase is a Hebrew idiom. So what's an idiom then? That's an that's a, that's a interesting word in and of itself. Well, an idiom is a phrase that has a figurative rather than a literal meaning. And the meaning cannot necessarily be determined from the literal words. So don't think that when God says seek his face that you're going to get to see God's face. I don't want anybody in here to leave here thinking that you're going to ever see God's face in the seeking of him. You ought to know that because uh, the Bible talks about Moses uh, um, um, speaking to God face to face. That was an idiom in and of itself. That, that was not a literal thing. If you look when Moses talked to God, he could only see the backside of God. He could not see God himself. The Bible says there is no man that if you ever saw the face of God, you could not see the face of God and live. It's all right if you tell somebody, I talked to God, I saw God the other day. No, you didn't. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you that according to his word, you can't see God's face and live. I found out we don't even necessarily want to see God's face like we think we do. Not till you get over the glory. While you over here, the Israelites thought they wanted to see God's face. And Moses said, well, y'all come up to the edge of this mountain. And they start hearing all the noise and the going on. They said, oh, we don't want to talk to God no more. Y'all just be glad God has the mechanism of prayer the way he has it. You don't really want to see God like that. To seek his face doesn't mean you're going to see his face literally. It means that you need to seek his presence continually in your life. It needs to be such in your life that, that the presence of God in your life is more important than anything else in your life. Just let me talk to you for a moment. God's presence in your life need to be more important than any other relationship. Need to be more important than your spouse. I know that don't feel right, but it is right. God needs to be more important than your children. I know that don't seem right, but it is right. Even some of the other things in our life, maybe not relationally speaking, but it needs to be more important than your job. 
your means of, 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 of providing for yourself. God should be more important than that. He should be more important in your, your health, any of your accomplishments. There is nothing that, that you ought to put before God in your life. And, 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 and let me just say this, and, and we, need to, we need to talk about this nowadays because we come to God for certain blessings. I want you to know that, that God himself ought to be more important even than the blessings that you come to him to get. Because sometimes we use God like he's an ATM machine. God not an ATM machine. You don't come to God just for his blessing. You ought to come to God because he's God. You ought to come to God because of who he is. And God, because of who he is, will bless you because he loves you so much. But you come to God because he's God, not because of what you think he might do for you. Because I contest if you're just coming for what he's going to do for you, what happened if he stopped doing for you? So, so, so our relationship, so, so let me just say this clearly in, in a way that I hope you can take with you. There's a big difference between seeking God's face and seeking his hand. See, a whole lot of us just want the hand, what God can do. I'm saying you ought to seek his presence. That no matter what state you in, you have learned therewith to be content. Somebody spoke about peace earlier. The brother prayed about uh, peace. Didn't pre uh, Chris preach a little mini sermon for us on peace? But 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 that kind of peace transcends circumstance. Doesn't matter if stuff is going right. It doesn't matter if there's calamity. It doesn't matter if there's dirt in the land like we were talking about here. It doesn't matter that there's a famine. It doesn't matter. There's no rain. You, I'm still at peace because God is with me. So we got to get to the point that God is all we need. He sustains us no matter what. Now, I, I, I think we can look at Solomon um, because the, 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 the conversation that's going on, if you will, is between God and Solomon. Solomon prays, God responds, and, and, and I believe Solomon himself gives us the example of how we ought to seek God's face. Uh, um, now, we know he built the temple, but even before all that, when Solomon first became king, God appeared to Solomon, and he said to Solomon in a dream, he said, Solomon, you ask, and whatever you ask, I'll give it to you. Ooh, wouldn't that be good? If God, if, if, if you knew, now, if you knew, if God came to you in, in God's own way and he said, whatever, whatever you ask, and God don't lie, he's not like us. If he make a promise, he keep his promise. He said, whatever you ask, I'll give. Now, you think about that. If right now, and be honest, I know you know the end of the story, so don't make stuff up. You know how we do. We good Christians, so we say, well, I do just like Solomon. All right, now. You still in the church? Don't do that in the church. What exactly would you ask for right now if 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 God say anything you ask for? You got one wish. What would you ask for? Lord have mercy. Well, let's look at what Solomon says because I believe Solomon's response shows his humility and the humility we ought to have. Uh, when it comes to God. I, I, this is a verse that I just love. Solomon says in his response to God, he says, I am but a little child. I don't care how old you are, all of us are little children to God. He says, I am but a little child. And this is the part I like. He says, I don't know how to go out nor how to come in. You know, we used to say, well, I heard it, you know, you're a little fella, and you listen to the old people talk, and they had all these little sayings used to make me laugh. I remember hearing that that boy ain't got sense enough to come in out the rain. 
And that's what Solomon is saying. He's saying, he said, I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. You got me ruler over all these people. It's, it's men uh, amongst these people got way more experience than I. He said, it's men amongst these people might be better leader, have more knowledge, have more wisdom than I have. But now I'm the one that you gave all this to. He said, and I realize who I am. He said, and instead of asking for all this other, he says, God, give me an understanding heart so I learn how to judge your people. It's interesting that Solomon never asked for nothing for himself. He says, God, you give me an understanding heart so I know how to judge your people. It was all about God and God's people. It was nothing about Solomon. He says, I know who I am. I know my limitations. God, just make it where I don't mess all this up. And God, and this is how good God is. God said, it, it, the Bible says about God that his response was this. First it said, the saying pleased God. I, I want all of us to know this well. In your life, even in your Christianity, make it such that you know you're really trying to please God. I know there's a lot of stuff go on, even in religion. Uh, there's a lot of things that go on. But I think the most important thing is that we please God. And Solomon saying, pleased God. And God said this, boy, you just watch what happens when you please God. The Bible says, because you did not ask for riches, a long life, or vengeance on your enemies. I, I didn't mean to say nothing right here, but I just got to say this. I believe it's about 16 of us in here that if God say you got one wish, some of our enemies will be in trouble. I believe it's about 16 of us in here would have said, you know what, in 1989, I remember when she did that. And I got this one time, and I'm going to make sure she paid. Some of us in here would ask for the, you remember, you remember in the Bible that, that they asked for John the Baptist's head on a charger? That's what the, the King James say on a charger. Some of us would say, then give me their head. But Solomon didn't do that. He didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask uh, 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 for, for a long life, nor vengeance, nor any of that. He says, I'm, he says this is what God said. He said, I'm going to give you exactly what you asked for. I'm going to give you the wisdom and the understanding and you find out that Solomon, other than Christ himself, was the wisest man that ever lived on this earth. And God made it so because he kept this promise to Solomon. He says, but I'm also, because you didn't ask for that. He said, I'm going to give you more than what you asked for. In Ephesians, the Bible talks about, it, it, it says that, 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 that God is able. And I just love that he's able. God, the Bible said that God is able to do uh, exceedingly and abundantly above what you can ask for. Do you know if you ask for the right stuff from God, God got a way to give you stuff you didn't even ask for. And he said, you can't even imagine what I can do for you. But it's first, and Ephesians says this clearly, it's according to the power that works first in us. I told you that God is conditional. He can do whatever it is. You can't imagine what God could do. And sometimes we are the ones keeping God from doing in our lives what he can do in our lives. But for Solomon, he gave him the understanding. And not only was Solomon uh, the wisest man, when you start looking at it, comparatively speaking, he was probably the richest man, also who ever lived. But it started because he knew how to seek God's face. So can I tell you today that if you want blessings from the hand of God, then you need to first seek wisdom and guidance 
from the person and presence of God. Don't worry about the blessings. God got blessings. But first, seek his person and his presence. And God will do the rest in your life. I, I know that we want God to be our provider. That's why some folk go to church at all. But, but maybe God is waiting on us to commit our lives and our resources of him for his glory first. If, if, you, if, you, if you want God to bless your bank account, you ought to come bless God's. You ought to bless him first. God know how to take a little bit and make a whole lot out of He ain't, you know, it's funny. God ain't even got to put more money in your account to bless you financially. We think that's the way God got to do. God will make it where you ain't got to pay for some of the stuff you've been paying for. And that's a blessing financially, even of itself. Yeah, we want God to be a provider. Yeah, he'll provide. But the Bible say, why don't you let there be meat in my storehouse first? And, and I know we want God to be a deliverer. But maybe God is waiting on us to trust him first. You got tr you, you to gotta trust him like, like those three Hebrew boys trusted him. Oh, I just love them three Hebrew boys because when, 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 when they were told, you, you, you tell you what, you better bow down and worship somebody. Else. Them boys say, oh, no, not us. And I love their response to the key. They said, we not even careful. So I see when you're doing right, you ain't got to be careful. He said, we're not careful to answer you O oh, king, regarding this, because we will not. No matter what you do, I'm going to turn up the, the turn it up then. We're going to throw you in. Throw me in, man. But even if God don't come, we know that God is able. And boy, when you stand on God like that, you force God to answer your prayer. And them three Hebrew boys were thrown in. The fire so hot, the folk threw them in, couldn't survive the fire. But when they, they, they came back the next morning and they look in there, they say, oh, we threw in three. But there's a fourth one in there with them. And all the fourth one look like the son of man. Let me just tell you, it was the presence of God in the furnace with them three Hebrew boys that made them to survive all that everybody, you want to survive this life, let the presence of God be next to you. So you want him to be, want him to be a deliverer, just trust him. And I know this probably might be somebody here right now want God to be a healer. But if he heal you, will you serve him? Because if you heal your body, when it's time to work, are you going to work? And God may want to know that if I heal you, will, I, will you use your health and the strength in your body to serve me the way I need to be served? So I'm telling us, if we desire, because when we talk about Second Chronicles, you hear this preached. Most of this talks about God hearing us and God forgiving us. And God healing our land. But there is a condition you got to meet first. You got to humble yourself and pray. But you got to seek the face of God first. And I don't ever have to worry about whether God is going to keep his part of the deal. Because that's what who God is. What we have to do is to make sure we keep our part. Jesus said it like this when he got on earth in, in Matthew 6, and I think it's somewhere around verse 33. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. See, we too worried about these things. We too worried about good relationships and health and wealth and all that, accomplishments and all that. And God said, if you keep worried about that, I might go silent till you realize who I am and what, I, what it really means to serve me. And I'm telling you that God can do all of those things if we first seek him. 
That's the condition. That's our part. Trust God that he'll do uh, his part. So to the church this morning, um, I believe you heard his word this morning. And I believe you heard that you need to humble yourself. You need to, to pray. And if you need prayer this morning, I, I, I know wherever there's a people of God, there's some praying folk in there somewhere. And I believe we can pray together for whatever you need and God will respond. But you heard his word this morning. You heard that you ought to seek his face. E even if you need to pray to God, uh, and we pray together that you have a deeper relationship with God, we can pray for that too. Um, I, I believe that you heard in here, because this is a, a little known and a little mentioned fact in this text, that in here God is saying you ought to repent. Um, God is saying, yeah, I'll do all this, but you got to act right too. You don't get just do how you want to do in the presence of God. But if you ask the church to pray, God will forgive you. If you, if you say, God, forgive me, God, and he's not like us, he don't bring it back up. You know, you might ask somebody, your spouse, your friend, your family member, forgive me, and they might do it, but, but five or ten years later, come back with that same thing. You remember, do you remember the last time you did that to me? God don't do that kind of stuff. And that's why we ought to love him so, because how he handled us. And so if you need prayer this morning, when, it's, when the time comes, when the invitation song is sung, come ask the church to pray for you. When the church pray, God moves. Did y'all know that? Church prayed for Paul and Silas. Y'all remember that? And opened up a whole jailhouse because some people of God prayed. Now, I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring this forth briefly in the text, is that the text says, if my people. This suggests that the blessings are for his people. That has to be said. Um, that also suggests that everyone is not his people. And that's truth, whether we agree with truth or not. You know, truth stand alone. But even though everyone is not his people, everyone can be his people. But it's, the, it's a decision that people must make. You become a part of the people of God by obeying the gospel of Christ. If God is the one who saves and God is the one who rewards later in heaven, then we have to come to the realization and to the, you know, Chris talked about me and him being logical. That's true. If God is God and God saves and God has heaven as a reward, we don't get to tell God how to save us. We do not. God must tell us the expectations he has for us to be saved. And it's really simple. He says that you have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, well by definition, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. You can't get to God unless you come through Christ. And that, there is no, that is, it, it ought to be a period behind that. that. God is not going to be lenient on coming through Christ. But the obedience to the gospel um, is this, and this is through study of God's word, um, is that you got to first hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Got to hear it, and you must believe it. The Bible is clear. It said, he that believe it and baptized shall be saved. It starts with belief. You got to believe exactly what, what, what God did in sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And then it, the, we've learned that you got to repent. Peter told the folks on Pentecost, he says, repent, every one of you, and be baptized. So, so if he's telling them repent and be baptized way back then, that's still true today. Still got to repent. You don't get to keep living how you want to live uh, if you're going to be in Christ Jesus. And the Bible tells us also to confess. You ought to be able to say before anybody, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son. You know that's why he got crucified? Because he said he was the son of God. But we ought to say it. It brought him death, but it brings us life. And then be baptized. I want to say this clearly. And this is, again, logical to me. If Jesus had to be baptized, 
You know, I go to a whole bunch of texts and prove baptism is still necessary but for salvation. But even if you don't understand the text in the Bible the way maybe that we ought to, do you know that God required that Jesus was baptized? So why in the world would you think you don't have to be? If the Lord had to be baptized and he never sinned, here we are, can't hardly get out the church for we sin. How in the world would you think that is not needed for you? And that is the culmination of our salvation, baptism. It washes our sins away. And so I'm saying this morning, if there is somebody who uh, needs to be baptized, you should come running. You really should. Because all of us need our sins washed away. But if you've done that already, and, and you've seen that you got, God only requires this, that you acknowledge your sin, you repent of your sin, and we pray together on your behalf. And if there's anything in your life that you know you can't handle, and there's a lot we can't handle on our own, if we, can, if we pray together, God will bless us. He'll come out now, now, wait on him. Don't you give God your time limit. Just wait on him and he'll come. So I'm encouraging anybody who needs God this morning, whatever you need him for, why don't you stand as together we sing the song of invitation. Yield not to temptation for yield it is sin oh and the victory will help you and now some to heaven, you will comfort, strengthen, and keep, you I will, I know Jesus is willing to aid, you and King Jesus will carry you through, amen. Amen. amen, we want to, first thank you for listening attentively, we see several who are standing, and we're going to ask that as the brother comes to you that you speak uh, to the church. Yeah, I thank God I was given to speak to the church. But I want to let you all know my son, Jimmy, and my brother, Hunter. I don't know where he is in Houston, but he's coming. 